Hello, my name is Denise Manning and I work here at the Tarpon Springs Library. This afternoon, I'm going to do an introduction to genealogy. This is for those who are just getting started. So if we'll pause for just a moment while I share my screen, we'll get started. There we are. I hope you can see my PowerPoint screen and me in a little box in the upper right corner. This is our introduction to family history at the Tarquin Springs Library. The elements of family history that we're gonna go over today is traditional genealogical research. We're gonna talk about writing and organization and we're going to touch on genetic genealogy with just a little bit with what to expect when you get your DNA test results. First of all, for myself, I want to explain the difference between genealogy and family history. Genealogy is putting together a chart of names and dates, much like you see here. You see me here at the bottom, Denise, my parents, Dennis and Dorothy, my four grandparents, and my eight great-grandparents. While that's very interesting and very valuable to the family, I like to do family history, which is, for me, telling our ancestors stories. As an example, Les, my grandfather, as a kid watched cars replace horses and buggies. As an adult, he owned a Standard Oil service station in Minneapolis. My great-grandfather, Julius, born in 1874, left the family farm to become a professional photographer. My great-grandfather, Joe, from Sweden, and my great-grandmother, Elsie, from Norway, met as 20-year-old immigrants. Their native languages of Swedish and Norwegian were close enough. That, to me, is family history, telling their stories. Let's begin with traditional research, traditional genealogical research. Just as we've created paper trails in our own lives, our ancestors created ones much the same. Finding their paper trails is traditional research. Now, we don't think of having created paper trails in our lives, but we have. We were all born somewhere. There's a vital record in some city in the world in which we were born. We've perhaps celebrated religious milestones. There's church records. Perhaps we were baptized. Perhaps we celebrated bar mitzvahs. Maybe we were confirmed. We went to school. Maybe we went to college or served in the military. When we were married, we created two records. There's a court record, which is um, in the county courthouse in which we were married. But if we were married in church, there's also a church record. Now, I have two children. I appear on my children's birth certificates and my children's church and school records. Through all of this, I have voted. I've paid taxes. I've bought and sold real estate. I've even appeared in a couple of newspaper articles. Nothing terribly noteworthy but I've appeared. Now, I don't have any death records yet, but our ancestors do. But this is the paper trail that we're researching for our ancestors, the same paper trails we've created. Here's an example of a US Census record. Now, the census was taken in the United States every 10 years beginning in 1790, up until just this last spring, we're working on our 2020 census. Now here's one I found in 1880 for my Irish family in Northwestern Illinois. Now, yes, on census records, you will see this handwritten record. Now there is a typed index, but the handwritten record is the most valuable because there might be little clues in here that you won't see elsewhere. Now here's the Donahue household. We have Daniel, who's the head of household. He's 35 years old. He was born in Ireland. Both his parents were born in Ireland. His wife, Ellen, is age 30. She was born in Canada, but both her parents were Irish immigrants. They have two children, Dennis, a three-year-old, and William, a two-year-old. They're both the children were born in Illinois. Now, interestingly enough, the last two people mentioned in the household are Timothy Carroll and George Carroll. Timothy Carroll is 78 and George is 21. Now, if we didn't know who Daniel's wife was, if we didn't know Ellen's maiden name, now we know because in the household is Timothy and George Carroll 
Ellen's father and Ellen's brother, their father-in-law and brother-in-law to the head of household. So even if you have family that have stayed on the same farm year after year, it's still valuable to search them every 10 years, every, census, every time a census was taken, because there are clues, maybe what they're doing for a living, maybe who is living with them. There could be lots of clues you'll overlook if you don't look for a family in every census. As we're family historians, we're almost like private investigators. We have to use, look at each document we're using for clues. Now here's an example of a state death record. It is for Carrie Berglund. She's a great, great aunt. Now, um, interestingly enough, sometimes death certificates aren't complete. Here we have her name, of course, and that she's a widow. It lists her father, Hans Fatland, which is correct, and Hans was born in Norway. It doesn't list her mother. Maiden name of mother is left blank. That is because the informant didn't know that information, which comes to what one of our first clues is the informant himself, O.P. Ness. Now, we might look over that not knowing who O.P. Ness is, but with a little more research, we find that O.P. Ness is the husband of Carrie Berglund's youngest daughter. So within a death certificate, there's lots of information. The information recorded about the death, the death date, the death location, what she died of, where she's buried, all of that is, is fairly accurate information, as accurate as can be. But the other information, for example, her birth date, her age, her father's name, her mother's name, which was left blank, is all only as accurate as the informant. Now, I know for myself, I was the informant when both of my parents died. And in each case, by the time when my parents died, and by the time I'm giving this information to the gentleman at the mortuary, I am sleep deprived. It's one of the worst times of my life. I am not on top of my game. And so we have to think about that with informants. If we do find incorrect information on a death certificate, remember it's only as accurate as the informant. And this is probably not a great day for that informant. They've just lost someone very close to them and maybe they are sleep deprived as well. So here's an example of a state death certificate. The newspaper examples that I'm providing here are obituaries. Now, I know it sounds a little weird, but I really enjoy obituaries. They're like mini life stories. Now, this is the story of Henrik. He's my second great grandfather. He was one of the first of my family to emigrate from Norway in 1869. Henrik was a young 20 something, and he immigrated with his brother Thor, who was also the same age. Two young single guys. Now, this is fairly normal for our immigrants in the 1800s. Two young 20-something unmarried young men, um, and, you know, anxious for an adventure, go first to America. And then they write back and tell the rest of the family either this is great, America's great, everybody's right, or maybe they don't have such great stories to tell. But this is oft often what happened is um, two young men went first and settled and then um, wrote back and, and um, invited the rest of the family to come. Often sometimes um, helping, helping them come by, by sending some money home. So my question when I was researching Henrik, my second great-grandfather, I do know, know that he lived his life near his brother Thor, but I didn't know if Henrik and Thor um, immigrated uh, alone, if anyone came with them, or if anyone came later, um, if they had other siblings that emigrated, if their parents emigrated, I didn't know any of those answers. When I found my great-grandfather Henrik's obituary, it's a very nice obituary, but it didn't provide any information I didn't already know. Um, the informant for the obituary just listed um, his surviving children and their families, but it didn't list anything about Hen Henrik's family. What I did find a few years later was an obituary for his brother Thor. 
And in Thor's obituary, it lists that four brothers and three sisters survived Thor. And it lists that all of those siblings emigrated and they all settled in Minnesota, not too far away from Thor. Now the oldest son, Andreas, he stayed in Norway, as did the parents, but all of the other siblings emigrated. So with this information, I was able to research the brothers' siblings. So the, the information here is not just to research your direct line ancestors, but also to research their siblings and their parents. Finding historical records like I did here with census records and death certificate and obituaries is all about geography. There's no one place to find all records. Some records are online on mega genealogy sites like Ancestry.com and Family Search. Others are on websites hosted by state or local historical societies. Some records are still only in paper film or in paper or microfilm in libraries and other repositories. Land, probate, and other court records are often still in the county courthouse in which they were created. Church records may be at a regional diocese or other organization structure or may still be housed with individual congregations. Often getting to be friends with a church secretary can be very valuable. Like I said, finding historical records is all about geography. And one way to find out where the records are is to call the public library in your ancestor's hometown. Yes, here is my shameless plug for public libraries. Librarians know where the records are. So to find a hometown library for your ancestors, Google public library plus your ancestor's hometown or, or the city that's closest to their hometown. For example, Fargo, North Dakota. Um, put quotes around, uh, around your search terms like public library in Far Fargo, North Dakota, and I bet your first hit will be the, pub the main public library in Fargo. As I find out where the best places for my regional records are, I keep track of that. So next time I'm researching in the Fargo area, I will know where the records are. So I have a little notebook where I keep track of where the records are for the, my research areas. Subscription sites and free favorites. Now here in the Tarpon Springs Library, we offer some subscription sites for use in the library. Currently we have Ancestry Library Edition, we have American Ancestors, and we have Fold 3. And we are working on another one. These, web, uh, these databases are available for use in the library. But I have some free favorite sites that you could use anywhere you have an internet connection. Those are familysearch.org, findagrave.com, Chronicling America, and Cindy's List. All of these are great free sites. Family Search is the site hosted by the Church of Latter-day Saints. Find a Grave is an enormous site that, um, that, be that began small and surprisingly grew tremendously. Um, Local volunteers have transcribed cemeteries. Sometimes um, local uh, church groups, I've seen Boy Scout groups, um, genealogy groups have transcribed and photographed cemeteries. Chronicling America is a, is a joint venture with um, the Humanities Council and the Library of Congress. And they're digitizing many small local newspapers um, and all of those are completely searchable. Cindy's List is a compilation of genealogy websites and they're all cross-referenced by um, geography and by type of record like newspapers or death records. We're going to talk a little about, about organization and writing. As we're gathering all of this great information about our ancestors, you will find pretty soon you have a mountain of paper and you have to, you have to derive some kind of an organizational method. Now to begin with, I started with a ring binder with four tabs for my grand, grandparents and that's a great place to start. Gather up the documents that you have in the house. You might have more information than, than you think you do. Um, 
anything, any older documents I put in sheet protectors. I use pedigree charts and family group sheets to keep track of the information I find. And those examples are on our website. You will find a printable pedigree chart and a printable family group sheet. Before long, however, you are going to outgrow handwritten pages and you'll want to find some type of automated system. Now you can build your tree on Ancestry.com or a similar website, but a genealogy software program provides many more additional features and security. I'm going to talk just briefly about genealogy software programs. There are several good ones. Working in a public library, I'm not going to recommend a particular product. These three have been at the top of the market for many, many years and remain there. Legacy Family Tree, Roots Magic, and Family Tree Maker. As you can see, they're not terribly expensive, and this is not a price per month. This is a one-time one um, output of money. So, uh, for example, Roots Magic at $29.95 is a one-time $29.95. Also, Legacy and Roots Magic offer free standard versions. And many folks get by for a long time using the free standard version. Um, they're, they're completely, completely operable. Um, but also you can look at it as a way to test drive before you purchase. Here's an example using my Roots Magic program, and I selected Roots Magic many, many years ago. Um, I, was, I was a genealogy newbie. I just picked one and went with it, and that's really my advice. Pick one and get to know it really well. They all do much the same thing. Um, it's like, do you buy the Chevy or do you buy the Ford? They're both great cars. But what you can do with a genealogy software program, for example, here's mine. Here's my grandparents, Les and Louise. Here, this is short, uh, shortly before their um, 1922 wedding um, as a young couple. Now, Les and Louise went on to have four children. Um, here's their children, Levon, Dennis is my dad, and their sons, Patrick and Michael. Over here where Les's information, like his birth date, his marriage date, and his death date, and Louise's as well. But here we have Les's parents, Cornelius and Minnie, and Louise's parents, Julius and Carrie. Now if we click over here on this red arrow, we'll jump up the, to the next generation where we have Cornelius as the father, Minnie as the mother, and their children. But first, we're going to skip up a generation to Louise. And here, Louise, my grandma Louise, who was Les's wife in his household, she's now a child, the fourth daughter of Julius and Carrie. And again, we can go up a generation or down a generation by using the red arrows. But what's so um, wonderful about a genealogy software program, you enter the information one time and you can output it in a myriad of different ways. Here is a narrative report, and as an example, I'm using Les, my grandfather, and I've provided some family stories. I know you can't read this very well from the screen, but I've, I've um, transcribed Les's obituary and also some other um, personal information about Les, some of his stories, and importantly, these narrative reports can be printed and shared with family members who may not access an online family tree. Also, online family trees really aren't designed to print. You can print the information after a fashion, but they're really not designed to print. But with a, a software program, you can print a narrative report such as this, including the source of the information that you find. You can also print a pedigree chart. Like I said, you input the information one time and you can output it in many different ways. Here we have a pedigree chart with my dad being the point person, his parents, his grandparents, and his great grandparents. You can color code information. You can do all sorts of things. Also, whenever you produce a report, you can get an index of names at the end of the report along with an index of places. So this is a wonderful way to provide information to a family. 
Now you can easily, from a genealogy software program, upload a copy of your family tree to sites like Ancestry, Family Search, and, and other um, websites in which you can collaborate with others. I highly recommend collaborating with others. It's a w wonderful way to share information. However, I do want to provide a note of caution. Don't copy other people's family trees. I use the work, the research done by other genealogists as clues to find my own research or to research myself. Um, some people are really good at this. Some people are really good solid researchers. Others not so much. They just try to go too fast. And so these online family trees are filled with errors. So don't just blindly copy them into your own tree. Use the research done by others as clues clues to find the actual historic records yourself. Now let's talk about genetic genealogy, DNA. We've all heard about doing DNA tests for genealogy and um, most of us are, are kind of interested in that. So let's talk a little bit about genetic genealogy. Now, some people have privacy concerns about putting their DNA online and, and those are warranted. To um, think we have absolutely nothing to worry about is probably foolhardy. There, are, there is legislation in place to protect us testers from our DNA being used perhaps by insurance companies, by health insurance companies, or by, for employment purposes. The International Society of Genetic Genealogy is um, a, the, the best source for the most up-to-date information on genetic genealogy. And their web address is isog.org, I-S-O-G-G dot org. Now, along with this video um, on our website, you saw a handout for this class. Most of the information that I'm providing, the important stuff anyway, is in your handout. And this web address is in the handout. So please um, print, that, print that out for additional reference. There are four types of DNA for genetic genealogy, three types of tests. The first type we're gonna talk about is the most popular. It's called autosomal DNA. And we're gonna do a little bit of biology um, refresh from ninth grade. We all remember our ninth grade biology class. Each of our cells, uh, virtually every one of our cells, has 23 pairs of chromosomes. We inherit half of each pair from dad and half from mom. Chromosome pairs 1 through 22 are the autosomes, thus autosomal DNA. The 23rd pair are the sex chromosomes. Sons get a Y from dad and an X from mom, and daughters get an X from dad and an X from mom. Y DNA is that chromosome sons get from dad. And there is a specific Y DNA test. Of course, only males can test. Family Tree DNA is the only company that offers Y DNA testing. And they test at different levels starting at $119. Um, FamilyTreeDNA.com is where you want to go for that. Now, X DNA that sons, of course, get from mom, and we daughters get both from dad and mom appear with some autosomal DNA results. So um, four the fourth type of DNA is mitochondrial DNA. Both males and females can test. Um, you males get mitochondrial DNA from your mom, just as your sisters did. You um, and your sisters have identical mitochondrial DNA from your mom, but you males don't pass it on, where females do pass it on. For example, my two brothers and I have identical mitochondrial DNA from our mom. Um, my sons have that same mitochondrial DNA. I passed it on to my sons. However, my brother's children, my nieces and nephews, have mitochondrial DNA from my sisters-in-law. Again, mitochondrial DNA can be purchased at Family Tree DNA at $159. This chart, shows the comparison between the four different types of DNA. First of all, as you can see, the left side of the page is blue and the right side of the page is pink. The left side is dad's type side of the family, the right side is mom's side of the family. This is my family, your family, everybody's family. 
we have here on the bottom row, we have dad and mom. Then we have our four grandparents, our eight great grandparents, our 16 second grades, our 32 third grades, and our 64 fourth great grandparents. Now, a Y DNA test tests the direct male line. For example, dad, his dad, his dad, his dad, and his dad. Now, I don't have any Y DNA, but if we're testing my brothers, it would follow this direct male line. Now, keep in mind, a Y DNA test is not dad's side of the family. Some people come to me at the library and say, well, it's my dad's side of the family I'm the most interested in, so I want to do a Y DNA test, right? And I say, well, yes, but not exactly. A Y DNA test is only going to follow one branch of the family. So at the 64 fourth grade grandparent level, it's tracking one ancestor out of 64. It's not dad's side of the family. The whole blue side of the page is dad's side of the family. Now the same for mom's side. It's only mitochondrial DNA is only going to follow our direct female line up the very right side of our pedigree chart, up the right side of our family tree. It's not going to cover all of mom's side of the family. Now autosomal DNA covers all the ancestors. The blue guys here, the pink ladies here, and everybody in between. It covers all the ancestors. So you say, why would I want to do a Y DNA test or mitochondrial DNA test when an autosomal test will test all the ancestors? And the, the reason is because autosomal DNA is accurate only back about four or five generations. The reason that is, remember we get half of our DNA, a half of our autosomal DNA from dad and half from mom. Those 23 pairs of chromosomes, half come from dad, half come from mom. Well, so our grand, from our grandparents, we get about 25% of our DNA, right? Our eight great grands, about 12.5%. From our 16 second grades, 6.25%. Our 32 third grades, 3.13%. And by the time we get back to our 64 fourth great grandparents, we inherit only about one and a half percent from each of those people. And in fact, when we get back to that level, we might not inherit measurable DNA from a specific ancestor. What that means is, for an example, uh, many people come to me inquiring about their Native American ancestors. They say, Denise, we had a family story. Great, great, great grandma was Native American. I took a DNA test and I, I don't show any, DNA, any Africa or um, Native American um, DNA. Could this be a mistake? Or could, um, could the family story have been a lie? What's going on? And I say, not necessarily. Um, great, great, great grandma could have been Native American, but that far back, that and, um, and that ethnicity may not show up on your DNA. But it doesn't mean she wasn't Native American and it doesn't mean she wasn't your third great grandma. You just didn't inherit enough DNA, enough measurable DNA from her. But that doesn't mean a sibling or a cousin on that side of the family could have inherited enough DNA from her to appear on a DNA test. Now, as as I've stated, autosomal DNA is only accurate back four or five generations, but Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA is um, accurate back many, many, many more generations. In fact, when they find uh, a body that's been frozen in the glacier for 10,000 years, they're using mitochondrial DNA to find out about that person's life and how old that person is. So all the different types of DNA can be very valuable uh, for, your, if, for your specific research question. Back to autosomal DNA, this is the one that is the most popular, and it's the one that is tested at all of these testing companies. Ancestry.com, 23andMe, MyHeritage, Living DNA, and Family Tree DNA. And like I said, Y DNA to mitochondrial DNA is tested only at Family Tree DNA down here on this corner. 
I always suggest people start with a test from Ancestry or 23andMe. From there, you can um, upload to other DNA sites. Um, Ancestry and 23andMe don't allow uploads to theirs, so you do have to test individually with them. So either one of those is a good place to start. Now we're gonna look quickly at some autosomal DNA test result examples. These are from Ancestry.com. And this is a list of the matches that I got. So what do you get when you, when you send, in, send in your spit and your $99, what do you get? Well, you get two things. You get an ethnicity estimate that we're gonna talk about in a little bit, and you get a list of people whose DNA matches yours. Now this I find absolutely fascinating that from a database appears a list of people who share DNA with me. Now, you'll get um, some people that are very, very close to you. My granddaughter is in here. My niece is in here. But also, you get some more distant relationships. The two pieces of key information that you can use across all of the testing companies is the number of centimorgans that you share with a DNA match. Now, a centimorgan is something that was completely new to me when I entered the DNA world. A centimorgan is a unit of measure to determine how close a match is. The more centimorgans you share with someone, the closer the match. For example, I had my mom tested before she died, and my mom and I share 3,400 centimorgans of DNA, and that's completely normal for a mother-daughter relationship. My granddaughter and I share 1,800 centimorgans of DNA. Jennifer, my half-niece, she and I share 900 centimorgans. <clears throat> so you can see, the further away the relationship the less centimorgans you share. Robert is a first cousin once removed, and he and I share 400 centimorgans. Now, interestingly, with um, Ancestry, once you've determined how these people match you, you can add notes, and you also have the ability to color code some matches. You also look at each other's family trees to determine if you have common ancestors. The second key piece of information, or the second uh, key tool that Ancestry offers, as does all the testing companies, is um, shared matches. And what shared matches means is when we click on one of our matches, we go to a second screen, and here I clicked on one of my matches named Ross, and here you can see a little better, Ross and I share 208 centimorgans across nine segments. My next screen is gonna explain that a little bit better, but I've color-coded Ross green because I know that he, um, he is connected to me on my Irish family. Ross is my second cousin. Now, one thing that's interesting is these databases they don't know how people are related to you. For example, Jennifer is my half niece. She and I share 918 centimorgans of DNA. Now, Ancestry.com, they don't know how Jennifer and I connect. They only know that we share 918 centimorgans of DNA. And based on that, we're in the first cousin to second cousin um, range of relationship. Now, we're half niece and half aunt. Um, but once again, sharing that amount of DNA, there's several relationships it could be. And of course, the computer doesn't know that. So, but as, as I started with is when I clicked on Ross and I see this in, in um, additional information, I can also connect with, I can also hit the shared matches button. And when I hit the shared matches button, I get a sublist of people whose DNA share that whose DNA matches both mine and Ross's. So once I have determined who Ross is, and I have determined that we're connected through our shared great grandparents, Neil and Minnie, that the rest of these people, Jennifer, Robert, and Gail, also connect to Ross and I through Neil and Minnie. So as you can see, the shared matches tool is extremely valuable because once you've identified a few of your matches, you can identify many, many others. 
here's a quick table, and I included this table in the handout. Um, it, this first column is the average shared centimorgans with matches. The relationships, and as you can see, 3,400 um, centimorgans. When you share 3,400 centimorgans with somebody, one of you is the parent and one of you is the child or an identical twin. As we get to fewer centimorgans, the range of relationships is much, much greater. And like I said, all of this is in your handout. The second most valuable besides shared matches um, to the cousin matching is sharing family trees. Is to look at each other's family trees and see if there are, if you recognize ancestors in common. Now, this example is from family tree DNA, and as you can see, it's very, very small. You can't read it, but these two squares on the bottom are my parents, and the next line up is my four grandparents, then my eight great-grandparents, and my 16 second greats. Now, when I put my family tree online, I have it on every site on which my DNA is, I also include my third great grandparents, but for the sake of space on this slide, I cut it off at second grades. I blew up one of my second grades, Cynthia, as an example of the type of information that's important to include. Cynthia, like I said, is my second great grandmother. She's from Rensselaer County, New York. She was born in 1848. Now, just interestingly, I searched the 1860 census for Cynthia Bailey. Now, my Cynthia was a 12-year-old girl living in her parents' household in 1848, I'm sorry, in 1860. But do you know in 1860, there were 38 Cynthia Baileys in the United States? Now, Cynthia Bailey is a type of name that it's not super common like Mary Jones, but it's also not terribly unique. There are 38 of them. The reason I'm telling you this is that without some geography, like Cynthia, my Cynthia is from Rensselaer County, New York, and without a timeline, she was born in 1848, the information you provide will be way too vague. So, so please, on all of the family trees that you put online, on all of the copies you put online, please include a birthplace and a birth date. Your, um, your, ma your DNA matches will thank you. And once again, like I said earlier, with a genealogy software program, you can create a copy, a GenCom file, which you can upload to sites like Ancestry, Family Search, and any of the DNA sites. Your matches will thank you. So what's a second cousin once removed? I think I, I mentioned that earlier. Um, many of you may know this, but uh, if you need a refresher, a second cousin once removed, um, as an example, I'm using my great-grandparents, John and Annie. Now, John and Annie had a, a big family, but two of their children were Henry, over here, Henry, and over here, his brother, Oscar. Now, Henry went on to have a big family, but one of his daughters is Dorothy, and Dorothy was my mom, so here I am. And right below me is my son, Ben, and right below Ben is his daughter, Cameron, my beautiful granddaughter. Now, once again, Oscar, Henry's brother, had a daughter, Lorraine. Now, Dorothy and Lorraine were first cousins. Actually, they grew up together, went to school together. Lorraine had a son, Charles, and Charles and I have become buddies. Um, he, Charles is very interested in genealogy as well. So of course, Charles and I are second cousins. Children of first cousins are second cousins. Well, Charles doesn't have any children, but say he did, if Charles did have a child, his child and my Ben would be third cousins. If Charles had a grandchild, Charles' grandchild and my Cameron would be fourth cousins. But now, Charles' relationship to Ben Charles and I, of course, being second cousins, Charles' relationship to Ben is a second cousin once removed. Charles' relationship to my granddaughter Cameron is a second cousin twice removed. And you'll see these abbreviations 2C, 2R, 2C, 1R. This is much easier if you can create a little chart like this using your own family members, it will become much clearer. But that quickly is what uh, 
cousin once removed or twice removed is. So now let's talk about ethnicity. Now, the cousin matching is the most valuable aspect, element of DNA testing, but ethnicity is lots of fun. But I will tell you it's the least accurate, and I'll explain a little bit why. It's the least accurate um, element of DNA testing. Now here is my ethnicity map and my brother Jim's. Now we're mostly Norwegian and Swedish. We're three quarters Scandinavian and the other quarter is English and Irish. Now my brother Jim should be the same identical, right? We're full brother, sister, same dad, same mom. But Jim gets this section down here kind of between France and Germany. And I didn't get that section. So what's wrong? A few years ago, I found some research done by others. As you know, I couldn't immediately copy it into my family tree and I haven't had time to research it to verify it myself. But the research I found showed that one of our English, our colonial American ancestors was Palatine German. Now the Palatinate is right here along the Rhine River between France and Germany. So how come, if that's correct, now it lends evidence, the research I had found showing the Palatine German showing up in my brother's DNA lends evidence that that could be correct, but I still haven't done the research, so I still can't validate it completely. But why would my brother have that DNA and I didn't? Think about a pot of stew. We have all scooped into a pot of stew. One scoop, we might get two pieces of meat, one potato and three carrots. The second scoop, we might get one piece of meat, four carrots and only half a potato. Same pot of stew, each scoop is a little bit different. And that's the same way with autosomal DNA inheritance, it's a little bit random. I got half of my DNA from my dad and half of my DNA from my mom. When my brother, well, my brother's older than I am, he came first, he got a different mixed up half of dad's DNA and a different mixed up half of mom's DNA. Same pot of stew, little bit different DNA results. So keep that in mind, full siblings can show different ethnicity estimates. Remember when I talked about the Native American ancestry and someone coming into the library and saying, it didn't show up in my DNA test, but it's been our family story forever. That's why I say it might not show up on yours, but if you are trying to pr prove a particular ethnicity, test your other siblings and test cousins on that side of the family. Because if that ethnicity doesn't show up in your results, it could show up just as my brother's Palatine German DNA showed up. Um, it could show up in other siblings or cousins. Now that doesn't mean that actually it was a third great grandmother for us that was Palatine German, if, if this is, um, that research is correct. Um, it doesn't mean she wasn't my third great grandmother too. I just didn't inherit enough of her DNA to be measurable on my ethnicity estimate. Now let's look at some other examples. Before I go on though, what I do wanna tell you is these ethnicity estimates are the most accurate in parts of the world where DNA testing is very popular, like the United States. Now, in the, um, in the British Isles and the Scandinavian countries, it's still very, it's very, very popular, just a couple steps behind the United States. But in other parts of the world, it's not as popular. It just hasn't caught on. And I have another example for you. This is one of my coworkers, Irene, and I coaxed her to test because she's half Greek, and I wanted to see how her Greek ethnicity would appear on a DNA test. And she was kind enough to allow me to use her ethnicity map for this presentation. Now, Irene's mom is um, English and German. And so when you see um, up here, the United Kingdom, and this whole section of Central Europe, 
And that's really the way German DNA um, appears because um, as many of you know, there wasn't a Germany till 1870. It was all these individual um, Germanic states. <coughs> so these DNA tests do have, do have some trouble with Germany um, because it is so close to France, it's so close to Switzerland. But um, what we're seeing here in the United Kingdom and Germany is her mom's DNA. Now, oops, her dad is half Greek. Her dad comes from the tiny island of Simi, which is right off the coast of Greece and the coast of Turkey in the Dodecanese Islands. And anybody who's familiar with Tarpon Springs and the sponge docks, you'll know about the Dodecanese Islands. So Simi is right here. Now, Irene's dad is directly from Simi, and as far as the family knows, for generations they're from Simi. So why does this ethnicity go all the way from Naples, across Italy, across Greece, and across Turkey? They're crying out loud, it's the whole Mediterranean. And he was from this tiny, tiny, tiny island of Simi. And it's because there is not a lot of Greek people in the DNA databases. Now, the thing that is most important to remember with ethnicity estimates, no one's digging up any ancestors. When we send in our DNA sample, they're comparing our DNA with test populations living today. And just, just those two words alone, test population, screams estimate, but also, all over the world, but, but now we're look, right now we're looking at a map of Germany. So many of these country borders have a whole lot more to do with 20th century politics than they do with ethnicity. These country borders, people cross these country borders all the time. Think about my Vikings for crying out loud. They were sailing up and down the west coast of Europe. They didn't behave themselves, and I'm sure that they didn't keep the DNA to themselves. So, once again, people moved around more than we think, more than we may think they did, but also our DNA estimates, most importantly, are based on test populations living today. And those test populations are made up of people who have DNA tested just like you and me. So um, if you have predominantly colonial American DNA, you are going, the test populations are enormous. If you have DNA from the British Isles, Scandinavian, the test populations are enormous and the ethnicity estimates are pretty accurate. But if you have ethnicity from a part of the world where DNA testing hasn't caught on real well, the test populations are very small, and so they'll be very, very broad, very, very generic, and you might be disappointed with what, with what you see. But when you understand why that the test populations are just very, very small, it's, a, it's easier to understand. We've all seen the commercial, the Ancestry commercial, where the guy had to give up his lederhosen and buy a kilt. He sold lots and lots of DNA kits, believe me. Perhaps he's not on TV in Greece. He probably isn't on TV in Greece. Now, Anybody in the world can go online with their visa card and buy a DNA test. But in some parts of the world, it's just not as popular. It just hasn't caught on yet. And that's why the test populations in some areas are still kind of low. But more and more people are testing every day and they're um, updating these test populations all of the time. Um, in the number of years that since I've first tested, which I think is about six or seven years now, I've already seen Wow, three or four ethnicity upgrades. Now, it doesn't mean my ethnicity has changed at all. It's the same ethnicity I've always had. But um, as these test populations are growing and the science becomes more um, sensitive, uh, more specific, uh, the ethnicity estimates are getting more specific. So, to wrap things up, I want to talk about studying on Facebook. Now, as you probably have seen, DNA testing and all of genealogy can be a little confusing, um, a lot of detail. And so I, I highly recommend um, it putting in some additional time studying. On your handout, I have um, recommended my favorite genealogy books, my favorite DNA books, but also um, 
unbelievably, Facebook is an incredible community of genealogists helping each other. Now for genetic genealogy, there's, um, I can suggest DNA Newbie. If you're just starting out, this is a good, DNA Newbie is a great Facebook page, page to join. Genetic Genealogy Tips and Techniques is another, it's one of my favorites. And the International Society of Genetic Genealogy that I've already talked about has a Facebook page. And so what are these Facebook pages about? Well, what's so cool is people like you and I can ask questions and often the experts in the field are answering the questions. And um, you can participate if you wish, you can ask questions, but just reading the questions and answers is a great education. And sometimes at night when I'm tired, slogging through a textbook is kind of rough, but if I can curl up with my, um, my tablet or even my phone and um, review some of these Facebook pages, um, I get an incredible education. As you know, I have a lot of Norwegian genealogy and I'm only a third generation um, Norwegian. And so many of the uh, areas that I'm researching are the church record books in Norway. And of course they're Norwegian. I only know about five Norwegian words, but what I can do is I can take a little snippet of um, a sentence or two from a Norwegian church book and I can paste it into my Norwegian genealogy Facebook page, and within about 15, 20 minutes, um, I have a translation. Now, you don't want to ask somebody to translate a couple page letter for free, but it would be, um, it would be okay to, to, in a Norwegian Facebook page to say that um, you have a two page letter and you'd be happy to pay for a translation, and that would be appropriate, but um, asking for, um, someone to transcribe just a few words. Um, it happens all the time. It's a tremendous, tremendous resource. There is a Facebook page called Dead Fred's Genealogy Photo Archive, which is incredible. But what Dead Fred does is you post pictures of people you may have in a shoebox in your closet and you don't know who they are your mom or your grandma didn't write on the back with a pencil and you don't know who these people are. You can post them on Facebook and if there's someone that recognizes the person, you might find out who your photograph is. So yes, Facebook is an incredible, incredible tool for genealogists. So take advantage of it. You don't have to post pictures of your lunch. You don't have to post pictures of your grandchildren. You can even set up an anonymous Facebook um, account. You can be Sue from Nebraska um, and be completely anonymous. But it is a huge resource for genealogists and family historians. So in conclusion, there's lots of help um, here at the Tarpon Springs Library and at most every local library. We ha I have a startup pack that I created that you can grab at the reference desk for if you're brand new. There's the, um, we have a genealogy group that meets here at the library on the first Monday of every month at 6.30. Each month we cover a different topic of genealogy, um, traditional research and DNA. We have library staff and volunteers available to help. And yes, study on Facebook. And as a good librarian, I'm also gonna have you check out one of those books I posted um, on the handout. There's lots of, um, there's lots of ways uh, to find help. So um, get started. Our ancestors' stories are waiting to be told. And I thank you so much for joining us. And um, like I said, the pedigree chart and the family group sheet are on PDFs that you can print out and get started. A ring binder and those two pages make copies of, and that's a great way to get started. So have fun and grow your family tree. Thank you.